Welcome folks on YouTube. I want to give some perspectives on how applied topology has evolved for the better over the last 20 years. I would say the first decade of applied topology, it was really the perspective that the long bars mattered and the short bars could be thought of as noise or sampling effects. You know, this particular um, picture is an example of that. So, um, you know, you have this data set that looks roughly sampled from a circle. And as you grow um, the simplicial complex that you build on top of it, you might think of this loop here as being a noisy loop um, corresponding to the short bar. Whereas this loop is really measuring something true about the data. It persists for longer and corresponds to this longer one dimensional bar. And that's very much the case. And there are rigorous theorems proving that under certain sampling guarantees, if you ignore the short bars, you can recover the homology of the underlying space from the long bars. Okay. But applied topology is being used for a lot of different things now as well. And this is largely brought on by machine learning. So applied topology is also being used to study what I would call texture or local geometry. All right, so he here's a paper written by some mathematicians and some chemists at Colorado State University. And I really like this paper. So what you're seeing is a surface of a metal that was bombarded with ions, okay? And, and the surface erodes and it forms this pattern where each, each little white dot is an atom, okay? So when you take the surface and you bombard it with ions, you can see that sometimes this hexagonal grid seems to form. And then if the conditions are different, like the temperature, you know, maybe it's, it's close to a hexagonal grid, but there are defects. And then if you change the conditions even more, sure, you can really have a lot of defects. You know, you still have many hexagons, but almost just as many defects. So humans can look at these images and say, yes, this one is nearly hexagonal, whereas this one has a lot of defects. And so, you know, this is the grid that we should put in this um, computer chip that we're making, whereas this grid, no, we need to go back to the drawing board in our production pipeline for creating these hexagonal grids. Um, but how do you teach a computer to recognize this? There's a lot of like local geometry information here. There's not global topology. There's not this one big circle or this one big sphere that we're trying to measure. Okay. So let's use persistent homology to try to measure that local geometry. What you can do is, I'm gonna zoom in. You can find the peak in this image of each, you know, um, find each local maximum, right, which is, find each local maximum of, of color, which is going to be, you know, these red dots that I've drawn. And now think of that as your point cloud. And on top of that point cloud, build the viator Schrips complex. So you increase the scale, and eventually you reach the scale where it seems like many, many edges appear all at once. If the grid is, grid is perfectly hexagonal, I mean, every single edge would appear at exactly the same time. So, so what would that look like in the H0 barcode, you know, the zero dimensional barcode? Well, you'd have tons and tons of small little features, one for each atom, that at this particular time all die because you just merge into one connected component that lasts forever more. And, and what does the one-dimensional barcode look like? Well, if you, if you use the viator Schrips complex, then, you know, whenever the three edges appear, the, the triangle gets filled in. I'll make my triangles uh, green. You can't really see that. So as soon as the three edges appear, the triangle appears, right? So in the viator Schrips complex, you would get no H1 bars at all because whenever three edges form to give you a triangle, that triangle would immediately get filled in. So, so what the authors did in this paper is they looked at things like the variance. Uh, 
of the lengths of the zero dimensional bars. And they looked at things like the sum of lengths of the one dimensional bars. And they, they use that as measures of regularity. So in this picture on the right, um, we are gonna have zero dimensional bars that you know, have slightly different depth times before everything. Else. So you're gonna have higher variance for the zero dimensional bars. And in this picture on the right, um, you know, maybe you have four points they don't really form a triangle so quickly, they form the square. And so you are going to have some um, small noisy bars in the, in the one dimensional persistent homology. So your hypothesis might be that a hexagonal grid has low H0 variance. Right? All the bars have exactly the same length, so the variance is zero. And they have low H1 sum. The one dimensional homology barcode is empty. Whereas in this more irregular pattern, you're gonna have higher um, variance in the lengths of the connected components. Different things are gonna connect up at different times. And you're gonna have a higher um, H1 sum. You are gonna have some squares that form due to the irregularities in the pattern, even though they get filled in soon after. So let me end there. This is the perspective of you're still using persistent homology, but you're using it to measure local geometry, texture, um, nitty gritty details at the zoomed in level, instead of using persistent homology to uh, measure shape at the zoomed out level. Questions? Thanks so much.